So hi, hello everyone again and welcome to another Saturday microscopy live stream. Microbe Hunter here. Well, today I wanted to put a few fungi under the microscope. I also would like to make a few permanent mounts of fungi. You might kind of be wondering what in the world do I have here? Well, these are all cheeses. Uh, it's a cheese, 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 uh, three of my favorite cheeses. And uh, there are fungi growing on these cheeses. So they will be our source of fungi. But I've also got a Petri dish over here with a fun fungus on it. Um, I got some mushrooms here as well. Yeah, and uh, so I'll be trying to prepare um, a few fungi today um, again. Um, yeah, I hope uh, that it works. <laughs> and then we're going to look at them, of course, uh, under the microscope. Um, if you're new to this uh, live stream, of and also if you're not new, a uh, big welcome to all of you, of course, around the world. Um, I've been doing the live stream now, what, for approximately, well, for several months, maybe a year now. Yeah, and uh, it's become customary that... Uh, because we've got people from all over the world, microscopy and biology enthusiasts from all over the world. It's always nice if you kind of uh, briefly mention in the chat uh, from where you're from. Now see, I'm seeing that people are already saying hi here. Um, yeah, and uh, over the years, not years, <laughs> over the months, uh, the more and more people started to, to write comments in the chat. Um, and uh, it's like this that I will try to answer your questions. Um, even if you're a little bit off topic, as long as they're microscopy related, uh, I will try to answer them. Uh, but I would like to ask you, please, uh, because there are so many posts already in the chat that you please, if you have a specific question for me, that you make uh, write an at microbe hunter, that you write that there so that I can quickly skip over um, all of the other lines, because sometimes people are uh, communicating among each other um, and uh, it's difficult for me to uh, both talk and do something on the table and then the microscope and then read the chat and so I might overlook a few uh, comments or questions. So please include the at sign, um, yeah, micro puncture if you specifically would like to ask me something, okay? Uh, because then I'm not going to read every line um, and this kind of keeps um, everything a little bit more um, yeah, um, efficient. Yeah, so um, I've seen that uh, there are already people from all over the world uh, who signed in here and who are saying hello. Yeah, I basically also jump ahead and say hi, uh, hello to everyone, okay? Um, yeah, and um, essentially I already have uh, one of the comments here and please apologize if I skip one, but uh, there's already a question here is I'd like to see the nail fungus uh, and tardigrades. <laughs> okay, yeah, um, nail fungus maybe not today, um, but I'm working on that. Um, indeed, uh, I want to also um, uh, extract some fun fungi from from the human body. Uh, maybe if you've got athlete's foot or something like that, it's not so difficult. Uh, but not today. Um, but uh, and tardigrades uh, also not today. But I did make uh, some videos of those um, um, already. Now. Um, but uh, basically, I will probably keep on uh, covering target rays anyway because they're quite popular. So what I've got here as well, and maybe you've already seen some of my other video, uh, one other video that I just recently released. I still have it here. Look at this, okay? Uh, these are the so-called black wood ear mushrooms, I think they're called. Um, and uh, yeah, they're quite uh, interesting looking mushrooms here. Uh, I'm not going to eat those anymore because they have already been in the water here for a couple of days. <laughs> Um, but I pulled them out from from yeah from some food um, as well, and I, um, I also would like to put them under the microscope uh, uh, as well. Um, yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, maybe some of you have already seen the video which I released a couple of days ago, um, where I also put it under the microscope in the same channel, by the way. Just go, if you go back a little bit, and then I have an interesting thing here, also a fungus on a, a contaminant over here on a petri dish. Um, I'd like to talk about this um, as well. Okay. Um, um, can you show us some uh, uh, cordyceps? Um, okay, well, I have to see um, about that. Um, please, yeah. Um, I saw your video of the cytoplasmic screen of Illidia today. Yes, very nice. I was wondering how, uh, if you make the Tamlabs videos, do you use special software for this? Yes, I think this is uh, also um, a little bit of a question that I'm going to answer right now while I'm preparing some of those uh, uh, fungi already. Um, I've got a YouTube, uh, I'm also publishing YouTube shorts and occasionally in my videos I am also um, uh, doing a little bit of time lapse. And what I'm doing is actually quite easy. I'm simply recording a video for let's say 10 minutes. Okay, so I've got a camera and then I'm just recording it without touching the microscope. And then I'm using a video editing software and it's a free one that I'm using. It's called DaVinci Resolve. Um, it's a pretty advanced uh, one, but it's a pretty good one. And with that, I can speed up uh, however much I want to have it speed it up or even slow it down. 
Yeah. So that's essentially what I'm doing. It's a video in it. Basically, pretty much almost all video editing programs um, 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 allow you to um, uh, to do this. Okay. Um, so um, so time lapse is is actually quite easy to do. Um, and uh, yeah. So if, for example, if you want to take uh, videos of, of clouds, for example, and, and you want to see the clouds change, you set up your mobile phone, you just record for ten minutes um, or so, and then um, essentially you. Um, yeah, just speed it up in, in, in the video editing program. Okay, so what we've got over here is um, some brie, it's French cheese. Um, I'm going to explain you a little bit uh, because I know that uh, there are people from all over the world and not everyone might be familiar with um, with the food uh, here that, that I'm eating, okay? Um, cheese, as we all know, is a milk product, um, and um, the fung the white fluff that you see here on the surface, that's, of course, a fungus. Uh, now, it's not any fungus, but uh, the, the manufacturers of the cheese are inoculating the, 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 the cheese with the fungus. And what the fungus um, is doing is, is um, it releases enzymes um, into the into the cheese and this kind of gives it a, the typical flavor and essentially what the fungus does is it yeah it does extracellular digestion if you think about it, it kind of releases digestive enzymes into the cheese um, making it soft so if you're wait too long yeah then the inside is going to become really soft and, and, and almost liquid um, and then the fungus uh, starts to reabsorb uh, the, the, nu the nutrients. If I were, um, because I cut it off uh, yesterday and I ate some of the cheese, but if I were now to wait a few days, what's going to happen is the fungus from the side is going to grow over um, also into the, 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 the surface here which you cut. Okay, so it actually will continue to grow. Yeah, not so much if you leave it in the refrigerator. But what I'm doing right now is I'm going to take a little sample um, of this white fluff um, and I'm going to put it on a microscope slide. And in order to do that, yeah, I can either use, of course, some toothpicks and try to uh, uh, scratch some of it off, but this is difficult. So what I will do is, is I'm going to move, you know what, I'm going to move everything else away here. And I'm going to, because I will do, we'll need it later on again. Um, yeah, I just disinfected it. It's because I also picked up other samples and I do not want to, of course, contaminate my food because I'll be eating it. Yeah, But uh, one way of doing that is actually trying to get a little bit of this, uh, fluff off which is a little bit difficult but uh, to do um, so maybe scratching it off might actually work um, and then um, when you've got a little bit of uh, the white uh, yeah, uh, yeah, fungus uh, um, on here uh, then um, of course you would like uh, I would like to uh, add a little bit of water and I just realized that I don't have enough water here so I'm going to get myself a water bottle and uh, here we go and uh, up, I need some, um, I need a new tip, pipette tip. So in, in case you have not seen this yet either, so that's my pipette here, okay? And all you do is you go in here, you get, get yourself a new tip and then you, we're ready to go. You know, I take up uh, some of the water, I put it here. And now I try to, um, yeah, using the, toothpick uh, I try to um, scratch it off and wh what's important now is this is, maybe I'm gonna make it a little bit bigger for you guys M move it down is this uh, because sometimes the, the cells are very dense um, it's a good idea to um, to kind of uh, kind of spread it apart a little bit okay so this is um, actually the thing which is, I, I think, pretty important uh, of course I tried this already several times and I discovered that success um, depends to a large extent on how well I'm breaking apart the hyphae. The hyphae are the cells um, of the fungus. Okay, so and I hope that this is uh, going to be good enough. I, I see it, there is not a lot of sample here. Now you might even have some problems uh, seeing it. Um, okay, um, and then usually uh, when I put it under the microscope, <laughs> we have always this demonstration effect that things always work when I tried out before and never work well, just a second, I need a, a cloth. Um, it never worked quite as well when you actually <laughs> demonstrate it. Um, I always dry wipe uh, the cover glasses because even though they are fresh out of the box, uh, sometimes there is a little bit of, of uh, some, some dirt on it. And uh, yeah, and, and that's pretty much it. And we're going to try um, now to observe uh, this uh, under the microscope, okay? And uh, here we go. And this is the four times objective. You can also see in the corner 
yeah, what I'm able to see and let's see if this is, yep, we were a little bit successful. Okay, it doesn't look very nice yet. I know, I know. Let's go up a little bit with the magnification. I have to adjust the condenser as well. Um, some people were asking me why, why, why is this blue background? That is because I'm using polarized light. Okay. Okay, and I'm already pretty satisfied with the result. You might not see, think that it's very special what we are able to see here, but actually I'm quite happy because we are able to already see the general structure of a fungus, which is is that there are uh, those filaments, and these are the so-called the hyphae. And this is going to be a recurring uh, uh, thing um, that we're going to see in all fungi. If you see those l lines, those filaments here, okay? Those lines um, yeah, are the hyphae. And look at this. Could this be that those structures here are the conidia, some spores? Okay, let me uh, turn on the air roll here. Okay, so you see over here, I'm, I'm now using the 20 times. Uh, all of those lines here, these are the, the so-called the hyphae. Collectively, it is the mycelium, and those things here that you see could be the conidia, which are spores of the fungus. We're going to see that they actually will look different from depending on the fungus that we're looking at. Okay, so, yeah, so it's now 40 times, and you're going to see that uh, I think that those cells are pretty thin, actually. Yeah, they are pretty much uh, pretty sure these are conidia. Okay. So what you see is that a fungus um, is uh, yeah, a dense network here. It's so dense that you're not even able to see anything decent. And that's why I was breaking it up. Uh, um, yeah. It's a dense network of, of, of these hyphae here. Um, I want, um, why, am I, why have I chosen cheese? Um, the reason is, is because, um, yeah, some of you already know that I'm a teacher. Okay, and um, when you're doing microscopy with uh, children, um, you want to make sure that uh, you want to play it safe, right? Um, I do not like to uh, put uh, fungi mold under the microscope, um, which is unknown because uh, in some cases, or in many cases, if you inhale the spores, uh, it can cause some allergic reactions. That's something you don't want to do. And of course, if you now um, have sources uh, from food, like cheese, for example, then this is, of course, a, a safe uh, source, okay? Um, so uh, what I'm going to do now is, is as, as you <laughs> look and admire <laughs> these uh, things here, I'm going to go get back into the chat, okay? Yeah, hi, my, at Microbe Hunter, hi, greetings from uh, California, yes, okay. Uh, I'd like to pick some mushrooms, yes. I have had a very busy week uh, with my moss sample lately. Yes, uh, people are and uh, are trying to uh, yeah observe all the moss samples and other things. I'm just skipping ahead. Okay, um, I read that adding a lactophenol blue with potassium hydroxide makes the fungi clear, removing other organic material. I have not tried that yet, uh, but I also read that. Um, so um, I have to get those uh, substances. Yeah. Um, the hyphae, um, yes, the hyphae, it's spelled a little bit differently than uh, what you've spent. Yes, now it's correctly spelled in the next line. <laughs> okay. Um, um, the camera the camera is amazing. I'm surprised it can see what the microscope sees. Um, uh, well, yes, there's also a question that sometimes um, comes, uh, um, what camera system am I using? Um, I'm using a DSLR camera, uh, but my microscope uh, does not require a cam an optical camera adapter. So essentially the, the image of the microscope objective is directly projected onto the camera sensor. So there are no intermediate optics. Um, and this has the advantage that um, essentially the image quality is pretty good. Because in the more optics you have in between, uh, they sometimes actually disturb also the image quality. Okay, okay. Um, can you describe the anatomy of a fungus? Yes, that's actually something that I would like to briefly do um, anyway. Um, and um, how am I gonna how am I gonna do this uh, best? <laughs> I'm going to go back uh, to the desk view, and uh, yeah, these are basic. Are you? Yeah, here. Um, so basically, these are the mushrooms, like like uh, we're used to. And uh, when we p uh, pick it apart, uh, just like I've done right now, um, we are actually able to also see those hyphae. Okay. Um, however, this here is strictly speaking not the largest 
part of the fungus. This is only the so-called the fruiting body, which produces the spores. Um, the largest part of the fungus actually is hidden in the ground. Okay, so these are the fine hyphae, the mycelium as it's collectively called, which can be quite large. Um, some, for some fungi, many meters across. So these are the cells that are growing in the ground, for example, in decomposing wood and are basically releasing enzymes, breaking down the organic material and then um, absorbing the nutrients. And that's why wood that becomes moldy and, and, and starts to rot, is, uh, it starts to rot because the cells of the fungus, the hyphae, the mycelium, spreads through the decomposing wood. And then when the conditions are right, um, the fungus will produce so-called fruiting bodies where they are, um, these produce spores. So I'm going to cut it open and you were able to see those, the places where the spores are produced. And what we have here now is the following. Um, where, where um, I need to switch over to the microscope again. Uh, what we see here right now is, is uh, the mycelium, the hyphae, um, and um, the fruiting bodies um, are so actually very small, tiny. Okay, um, so essentially, um, yeah, they're microscopic, and, and what they do is, is they produce uh, those uh, spores or the conidia, as we call them, that you see. Uh, I need to turn on the arrow again. Yeah, that you see over here. Okay. Um, some people might now um, also um, commented in one of my videos about how do they actually reproduce the fungi. Well, they produce, of course, spores. Uh, but um, what also happens is that um, when, for example, two of those mycelia, those hyphae, when they meet, what happens is that the cells will fuse together and then the DNA, two nuclei will fuse together. That's a form of sexual reproduction where actually the, the mycelia, they kind of fuse, the hyphae fuse together. Um, and this is how the DNA is combined and then you, this is uh, basically sexual reproduction that happens. Yeah? So you see that um, essentially the, the fungi, they are uh, quite interesting in, in, in that way. Yeah? So that's very, very br briefly. Microbe hunter can can do many face mites or to any mites kill a person or eat a person alive. Okay, so that's kind of the worry that some people are having. Is it is it possible that um, certain um, uh, face like uh, I've made videos about face mites that were kind of growing in the skin and, and so on? Pretty much all of us have it. Um, is it possible that they kind of uh, take over the body? Um, a parasite. Uh, I'll answer it differently. Um, if this were possible, then we would already know about it. <laughs> we don't know of any cases where this happened. Um, people who have too many face mites, there are some people in, indeed they have some red, um, it's called rosacea. They have um, yeah, red, uh, reddish skin, irritated skin. You've got to treat that, but it's not going to kill a person. Yeah? Um, as a matter of fact, um, uh, it, it would not be very wise for the face mite uh, to kind of uh, to kill uh, the person um, because then essentially it would be uh, yeah the face mite would also not be able to continue to live. Um, so indirectly, are there certain mites that uh, can transmit diseases? I mean, ticks, for example, are related to the mites. Yeah, sure. And, and so this actually, if they pass on certain diseases, not the face mites, right? But if there are certain ticks, they bite you and then they transfer um, the viruses or bacteria, borrelio Lyme borreliosis, we know about this, or encephal encephalopathy, there are certain diseases that the mites are able to transfer and then of course it can be a problem, okay? Um, so, but uh, yeah. What's the difference between DIC and polarized light? Um, I read somewhere that DIC is also partly using polarized lenses. Okay, this is getting a little technical. Um, yes, it is correct that um, essentially DIC uses a polarized light, but it also uses so-called Wallerstone prisms and they are uh, quite specialized. Um, so it is not just cross-polarized, um, but, um, but it's a little more fancy. Um, the, uh, the optics are a little bit advanced um, in that sense, but you need a prism, you need two prisms um, in addition to that. So um, essentially, yeah, um, it uses polarized light, but it is not traditional polarization microscopy. Yeah, so um, so you know what? Um, <coughs> um, can I abbreviate your tag as MH, please? Yes, of course, of course. Okay, yeah. Um, is the fungus a live microorganism on the cheese that uh, excretes enzymes in the final part of its digestive cycle? Um, Short answer, yes, it is alive. Yes, it secretes enzyme. Why do you mean in the final part of its digestive cycle? It always, uh, if it's alive, it secretes enzymes. So for example, um, here again, um, yeah, um, if I 
I need, yeah, here, if I'm now were to basically wait a few days, and then I'm actually going to see how the white part will start to grow over the cut surface and will start to cover it as well. So it's going, it is actually alive, it is growing. Yeah. Um, why is this mold okay? Uh, you sh you, you've heard that you're not supposed to eat mold, right? Um, it depends which one. Um, this mold here um, is actually a defined uh, um, species. So the, the company added a certain species of mold, um, which um, we know does not produce any poisons and which is fine. Okay, um, but if I were to now see that other types of mold, other colors growing on here, I would not eat the cheese because you never know which poisons or toxins the mold produces. I, I'm not going to eat unknown mushrooms either, right? Uh, mushrooms can be extremely poisonous, it depends which ones, because they produce certain, some of them produce certain toxins that are very harmful. Mold is the same, same thing, right? But in this case, it's fine. Okay, so this was basically um, yeah uh, the, uh, the first um, example here um, of um, yeah, um, yeah of, of this. Um, look, you know what I'm gonna do because uh, it's just uh, interesting. I'm going to now show you because this is DIC different. Um, I'm going to now show you all the different contrasting techniques. Okay, so this here is now bright field. Okay, so that's uh, the the way that uh, that uh, in most uh, microscopes um, you'd you'd be able to see it. Yeah, this is the reason why I, I've, I'm using DICs is because uh, I'm making uh, YouTube videos and live streams and it simply adds a little bit more color. Um, if you want, you can also add color filters. So that's the only thing. It's, it's a question of, 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 uh, yeah, of making it kind of look nice. Uh, that's that's, uh, all of, that's the only reason. Uh. Um, so, but that is regular bright field. And um, I'm going to now also switch over to phase contrast and have not tried this yet. I have got one phase contrast objective and I have to adjust the correct filter here and I have to open up this and this is phase contrast. Actually here it's quite good. Okay. Um, yeah. So this is phase contrast. What phase contrast does is it converts objects of a, which are transparent but which have a different refractive index into changes of uh, brightness. So you see that some of the hufe um, now starts to appear darker. Some of the lines appear darker right now. Actually, they're transparent, but the optics converts the difference in refractive index of the cells into a brightness difference. Yeah. So, um, so phase contrast is pretty good for observing thin specimens, bacteria, for example, also individual cells, but it is not really nice if you want to observe, for example, larger organisms or water samples or so. Yeah. And so here we see. Uh, by the way, also very interesting um, to observe here. Um, if you now look at, um, um, you see that some, it's a little bit out of focus, but you now see that there are those rings around it. These are diffraction patterns. Yeah, so that's an artifact as well. But as you go into focus, you see that yeah, yeah, some of the structures starts to appear um, yeah, in, in bigger contrast. And depending on how the refractive index is compared to the surrounding medium, it either the structure becomes either darker or it becomes brighter. So that is a uh, phase contrast. Okay, just wanted to 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 show that to you because some of you might be uh, might be interested as well. I o I only have a forty times phase contrast objective here. So that is now. Let's go back again. This is again bright field. Yeah, and uh, oh, I bumped into it, and uh, w now I put the the want the prism back in. You see, uh, uh, DIC uh, needs a lot of light. And now I have DIC, and DIC is, uh, makes uh, the structures appear a little bit three-dimensional. Okay? So I'm still, I'm still uh, stuck with the first specimen. <laughs> okay? uh, is it possible to make some permanent mounts of fungi like this? Uh, which mounting media will be appropriate for that? Thank you for the question. I'm going to do this uh, now, because this is actually something that I wanted to try anyway. Um, and um, which mounting medium? Um, I recommend a mounting medium, and um, I don't. Uh, I got the bottle again in my cupboard over there. Um, it is um, um, essentially a water-based glue, very cheap. <coughs> you can buy it over Amazon. It's known as Elmer's PVA glue, which I um, am going to try out now. The reason why I um, Elmer's glue is well known, a well known brand, but they have white glue, don't get that, but they also have clear glue, completely transparent glue. And I diluted it a little bit uh, with water to make it less thick. Um, and then um, I mixed it uh, and uh, yeah, 
um, and I filled it into, into a bottle like this so it's easier to take out. Give me 10 seconds, I'll get the glue. Here it is. So, because this is actually a question that does keep on reappearing uh, because people want to make permanent mounts. That's the glue that I'm using. Um, and yeah, it's child safe and so it's only um, and it's completely clear and transparent. It's PVA based um, and uh, this is indeed also a uh, PVA is indeed a, also a, known as an official mounting medium uh, which is also used and I like this one because it is water based. In, if um, you use resin based glue, um, not use uh, mounting media, then it can be that the cells start to de dehydrate quite a bit. So um, I'm going to do the following now is, is um, I'm going to you know what why not try to make a a permanent mount with yeah l let's use the same one again okay um, and I need I need a clean slide um, I always dry wipe my slide and uh, let's uh, take again a little bit of a, a specimen here so I'm going to again scratch off uh, some of the okay there's again a little bit of white stuff um, on here and um, again I'm going to now uh, put it down here um, on the slide and I have to uh, separate and pick it apart again but um, now together with a little bit of um, of this uh, mounting medium this PVA glue and um, what I would like to do, and I hope I don't forget, is um, it's going to dry, of course, um, over a day maybe or so. And then next week or, or so, I'd like to have a look at it again. Okay, so let's see how well it actually, um, yeah, how well it actually uh, works. I mean, I know it works because I've made already some samples uh, um, last year. And uh, here we go. And uh, now I have to, I'm going to take a second toothpick. Let's move uh, the fungus in here and let's kind of try to pick it apart a little bit. Uh, see, it's difficult to see. The advantage of uh, this uh, PVA glue is, is it's water-based. So and for this reason, the specimen itself does not have to be completely dry. Because if I use, for example, other mounting medium, uh, common mounting media are, for example, resin-based mounting media. Um, they, they use uh, sometimes toxic solvents as well. Yeah, and uh, that's only one thing. Uh, but um, they have to be completely dry because uh, any moisture um, will um, not be compatible. Uh, with the mounting medium and there might be actually some clouding happening the water um, cannot escape later on and this basically means the water is going to be enclosed by the mounting medium which can cause a kind of a decomposition of the specimen basically um, yeah uh, uh, breakdown by bacteria yeah um, and then this uh, can also uh, yeah cause the specimen to become very unstable I hope uh, I have I hope that I have enough of the specimen here yeah, um, usually what I do is, is um, yeah, you have to get it aligned a little bit here and I press down. There is usually a little bit of, of glue squeezing out on the side. And um, this is now the time um, when you normally have to wait. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to put it under the microscope in any case, but one has to be very careful because there's a little bit of glue, uh, glue coming out here. It's dangerous uh, that uh, the objective might get in contact with the glue. Okay, I don't want that to happen, so I'm not going to use a very high magnification. I'm just going to make a very quick check um, that I'm actually able to see something. Now I'm seeing that I'm, I'm still on the first sample only. <laughs> actually, I want to try the other samples as well. That's that's fine. Okay, so let's. Um, it's too bright. So there are a, a few bubbles. Ah, yeah. Here it is. Again, uh, I did not pick it apart very well. Uh, I did not pick it apart very, but you can see over here, um, I, th I can go up with the next higher one as well. Yeah. But we are able to see a few of the individual cells here. 
See, that is an, that's an actually nice example to which demonstrates that uh, yeah, if you don't uh, pick it apart a lot, then many things stay together as a clump. But there are indeed some some places. Let me use the arrow again. Does the arrow work? Um, here, here we go. Here's the arrow. Uh, you can actually see some some individual cells here. Yeah, here on the side. And again, some some of the spores. So um, I'm going to the glue is not complete is 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 still liquid. That's why it's kind of floating around. But what I'm going to do is, is I'm just going to um, leave it at that uh, as that, and I'm going to wait until next week um, uh, to see how this actually um, works. But again, I've done this now very quickly, okay, um, and was very impatient. Uh, so when you try this, uh, uh, give it a little bit more time uh, picking apart uh, uh, the sample, okay. So I'm going to remove this again here and we're going to go back to the desk. We I'm going to I have to now remember the sequence uh, so that um, I don't forget uh, which specimen is what, okay? Um, there is, what's the difference between a mold and a fungus? Yeah, uh, yeah it's answered here, a mold or a type of a fungus. I'll skip down again. What does the fungus feed on in order to excrete enzymes while it's on top of cheese? Um, so it works like this. Um, it feeds on the cheese. Um, seriously, um, um, a fungus is um, is a um, is a so-called a saprotroph. This basically means that um, um, essentially um, it uh, releases enzymes for digestion, which breaks down the food, and the nutrients are being absorbed back into the cells, and that is uh, the, what the fungus actually uses as a source of energy and for growth and for making new enzymes. So, so that is kind of the the, the thing. So, in other words, yeah, the cheese essentially is, <laughs> that's what some people are saying, is essentially controlled spoilage of milk. Yeah, so that's essentially what happens. Yeah? So we're kind of using microorganisms to, uh, yeah, to, to, to give it a controlled spoilage and because cheese is, under quotation marks, spoiled milk, if it's already spoiled then other microorganisms, which are bad, have a more difficult time to actually feed on it because it's already occupied with the, the mold on the cheese. So it's actually also a way of preserving food. So for many hundreds or thousands of years, um, uh, microorganisms, uh, fungi, bacteria, and so on, have been used to actually preserve food. So if the good microorganisms grow on the food, then the bad ones, which produce poisons and so on, cannot grow. Yeah? So this is kind of the, the strategy a little bit. That's why in, in all cultures you will uh, find so-called fermented products um, um, or yeah, microbiologically uh, made products which essentially are uh, is food which has been basically preserved by the addition of certain microorganisms. Okay? So um, will you seal the cover glass with nail polish to avoid drying fast? No, I will not do that. Um, because um, I actually, in this case, I actually want the, the PVA glue to completely dry out. Um, there is, in, a, in the previous video I already mentioned that there are certain mounting media like glycerin gelatin which should not completely dry uh, out, so they kind of remain semi-solid and then you have to seal the cover glass. But this PVA glue is able to dry completely. Okay, so there is no need uh, to, seal, uh, to seal it and I, actually I do want it to dry completely. Yeah? Um, are the enzymes the fungus excretes another live microorganisms? No, the enzymes, enzymes themselves are not live organisms. Enzymes are chemicals. Um, it, it, it's actually just like we human beings. When we digest food, then our uh, digestive system also releases, dumps out enzymes, uh, which are proteins that, which break down the food. Right? But they are not alive on their own. So that's important. Yeah? Uh, so that's um, uh, very important that those enzymes um, alone are catalysts. They are able to speed up chemical reactions. They're able to break down substances. But the enzymes on, them, uh, on their own are not alive. They're proteins. Yeah? They are not able to reproduce on their own. Yeah? Um, so, um, yeah. So what I'm going to do is... is um, Let's, um, yeah, I'm, I'm going to just move on, okay? Um, next uh, next specimen that I would like to look at is, I don't know, I'm, I'm just gonna go through my cheese <laughs> here. <laughs> Let's stay with the cheese. Um, this is, uh, not everyone likes it, it's, it's one of my favorites. But this is, uh, uh, this is uh, a really nice one. 
blue cheese why blue because the mold is blue has a blue color okay so um, this is uh, a very strong tasting cheese okay um, and uh, Mm, yeah, actually doesn't even smell that strong yet because it's still packaged. Let me move up the camera a little bit so that you're able to see a little bit more. Okay, um, and of course when dealing with food, I always want to be very clean here because I'll be eating this stuff. Okay, so, so what do you see here? Ah, look. <laughs> normally if you see this on bread and another food you do not want to eat this stuff here right but here that is actually fine right so again we have um, yeah, our white fluffy mole on the outside but look on the inside yeah, it looks greenish bluish okay so that's uh, again a different type of mold um, and uh, yeah that's why uh, yeah it does look pretty spoiled in that sense um, but it's a really nice tasting cheese yeah and um, as before I'll be taking um, a, a little specimen I want to take some of this blue stuff here okay you have to be kind of careful when I remove this that I don't take uh, some of the stuff of the cheese itself yeah, um, yeah you can actually see that it's a little bit dark already here so let's put this under the microscope now okay so let's package it again because I don't want to I don't want this to yeah. So let's put it away. So and uh, now what? Um, I'm going to be, um, add a little bit of water again. And uh, let's uh, try to uh, dissolve here. Now it's a little bit easier because we can actually see the, the blue, grayish blue color of the mold. So. And uh, of course, uh, we want to have a cover glass. As always. Penicillium, the question is, is Penicillium Roqueforti? I don't know. I know it's, it, as I've heard it's a Penicillium. I don't know if it's uh, Roqueforti. There is also some ro Roquefort cheese. Um, yeah, um, which uh, contains uh, also a whole bunch of, of bacteria and, and fungi. So, um, but it could be. So let's uh, let's uh, have a look at this here now under the microscope. Microscope view on. So let's put it again here. Let's uh, hope for the best. Ooh. Okay. Um, let's uh, switch off the arrow. So let's focus a little bit. What do we see here? Oh, little dots. Uh, could it be that these are spores? Yes, <laughs> now we got some spores as well. Okay, 40 times, let's go, go up with the light. Beautiful, I love this. Okay, so those little round circles that you see, these are spores, lots of them. Um, you can also, of course, also see again some, some hufe that I, I, I collected uh, along. These are, of course, those long structures that we see here, again, cells. Yeah, and uh, then those round dots, these are the spores. Yeah. That's, uh, yeah. So I collect mostly spores here. So it could be, uh, let me guess, uh, uh, that maybe uh, as soon as the, the blue parts of the cheese are, are those parts where essentially the spores are being formed. And maybe the white parts of the cheese are those parts where we have uh, still a lot of the mycelia, the hufe. Yeah. Ah, yeah. It's a little difficult to see here, but look, it looks like a little bit like a like a like a tree, okay. And usually the spores are kind of forming on the um, on the ends. Um, if you have if they have this kind of uh, this uh, um, structure where the uh, spores are forming externally, then they're called basidomycetes. I hope I pronounced this correctly. The ascomycetes and ba basidomycetes. Um, uh, these are basically the two types of fung fungi that we have here. And here it looks like that those. Uh, structures um, the spores form externally yeah. very nice okay i will tell you now a little bit of a, a thing that i tried today in the morning and where i failed um i i, I failed i wanted to actually um get some of those spores to germinate 
So what I've done is I've collected some spores and I added some uh, some uh, nutrient medium, some yeast extract medium. And I also tried coffee because I know that uh, some some molds like to grow also on co in coffee. And um, I waited I don't know twelve hours, uh, but unfortunately I was not able to make them germinate. Basically, that um, out of those spores a new new hyphae, new cells start to grow. Yeah. Um, yeah, because uh, maybe you know, I was not able to get the conditions right. Okay, uh, it could be that they don't don't like to germinate when they're completely surrounded by liquid medium. Maybe they need a surface to grow on. Many fungi actually um, they need to have a solid surface, so it could be that this could be a problem. Could have been maybe there was not enough oxygen beneath the cover glass. Um, so that's also a hypothesis. Yeah, but uh, I just wanted to tell you that I did not manage uh, to actually make them. Um, make them uh, germinate and make them grow. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. Um, are you using the words fungus and mold interchangeably? Um, yeah, um, e e essentially, uh, mold uh, fungus is this, the, the bigger category, right? Um, the fungi and and uh, basically, if uh, those fungi. Um, kind of grow on, on, on bread, uh, for example, in soil, uh, where you see a little co a colony, then we refer to them as mold. Yeah. Um, so eventually some other bacteria or fungi will spoil the blue cheese and then it becomes inedible. That is possible. Yes, definitely. So um, essentially, if I do not st uh, store the cheese properly, um, it could quite well be that um, um, that uh, it will start to turn bad, and you will see other um, colonies uh, growing on it, and um, that's not not so good. Then you have to throw it away. Yeah. Um, so are those spores one cell for now? Yes. Okay. These spores are are essentially individual cells, so to say. Um, yeah. Essentially, uh, and they're able to to kind of grow out and 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 then form yeah a new um they're going to divide and form a new new hyphae, a new mycelia yeah do you have 1000 x yes i have it but i'm not going to use it now because i'd have to use oil immersion and i'm really worried about using oil immersion um i need to fully concentrate because otherwise i'm going to contaminate the um how do you say the uh, the other objective so i'm using 40 times now but 60 times uh um, will actually already let me turn up the light uh, also show you uh, quite uh, everything quite nicely yeah. if you don't like if you're feeling tired of the blue color yeah let's change this around and you can have other colors as, as well okay yeah is a degree in microbiology all academia and research it's an interesting one do you basically mean if you get a degree in microbiology is it only research um, uh, this is an interesting question. Um, it's a little off topic, but I think it's important in, in any case. Um, short answer, it depends what you make of it. Um, I studied research microbiology, so I've got a degree in molecular biology and also bacteriology. So I was uh, not so much involved with eukaryotes, like fungi more, I was prokaryotes with bacteria. Um, and essentially what you make of it is up to you then. You get a training in the sciences, and if you now decide to go into research, then that's one thing. Um, if you decide to go into quality uh, control, then that's another thing. Um, if you have, have had uh, known people who went uh, into administration, patents, patent offices, uh, environmental control, I would say uh, what you make of it is the bottleneck is not the study. The bottleneck is you yourself. What do you actually make with your knowledge? And this applies to pretty much anything. Yeah? If you, of course, say, well, I, that's what I studied and I only want to do research because I studied research, then you're limiting yourself. But if you're kind of flexible and are saying, okay, um, I'm going to use my science know-how know a little bit to do YouTube videos like I'm doing, <laughs> then, then that's also possible. Yeah? And for me, that's, uh, YouTubing is, is also a, a, an important hobby, which kind of keeps me a little bit grounded as well. Yeah? Um, what is the reason that these kind of cheese should not be consumed by pregnant women or people with low compromised immune systems when they're basically safe for human consumption? Okay, I did, did read it. under very, very rare cases, if people, um, uh, because uh, the concentration of the fungi that you eat is so high, um, under very rare cases, it can apparently be 
uh, that uh, yeah, some people are either yeah, not able to, to control them somehow, yeah, and that they might actually cause some problems. Um, I don't know if, th if this is not more kind of theoretical, but there are also certain cheeses um, that I heard should, which should be avoided because there is also a higher risk of contamination yeah, or by other microorganisms if it is not properly produced. And for this reason, uh, pregnant uh, women should not eat them. Yeah. Um, there are certain bacteria that um, are not likely, but which have a higher chance of, of growing because what you're doing is, is as you're fermenting the milk and so on, it is possible if, if it's not properly controlled that other bacteria and fungi also start to grow there. Um, in low concentrations, which is generally not a problem for, for people who have a normal immune system. I, I know of this because I remember a long time ago, there have been some cases where they actually had to um, re retract some of the cheeses because uh, there were other microorganisms also growing in there which should not be on there, right? Um, yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah, listeria on, on cheeses. Yeah, uh, these are bacteria, okay? Um, would the spores grow into new mold plants? Um, yeah, yes, each spore will start to grow a new mold under the right condition, but strictly speaking, they're not plants. Sorry uh, that I have to be picky uh, because, um, uh, because uh, uh, fungi are heterotrophs, uh, they're not, uh, they not plants. So what I would like to do now is, is um, I would like to, uh, because I'm, I'm uh, kind of uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, Get, uh, running a little late. I, I'd like to show you now something, also something that I tried, which unfortunately did not work today, but I'm going to show you the principle. So if you have mushrooms, then you can try this yourself. As I mentioned, that these are the so-called fruiting bodies. Okay, so these are just regular uh, mushrooms. Yeah. Um, and uh, what I'm going to do now is, is I'm going to cut it open here. And you see that um, there's this gray, dark gray ring in here. I'm going to take this out here and we're, we're able to carefully cut this out. And this is the place where spores are formed. You see there are some, some tiny lamellae. Yeah, some, yeah. Unfortunately, I was not able to get any spores out and I think the reason might be that those mushrooms um, are still too young. Okay, so they have not completely opened yet. But I'm going to show you in any case, if you happen to get a mushroom, which is um, more mature and more ripe, um, and you see that, I don't know if you're able to see this. Uh, I've, got a, I've got a stereo microscope. <laughs> I'm gonna show you under the stereo microscope. Um, then we should see the lamellae. Just let me see if this works. Uh, let me turn this on. Yeah, the camera of the stereo microscope is always, uh, um, how do you say, the act, um, giving me a, a headache a little bit sometimes. Yes, here we go. Let me show you. Uh, I need to, yes, beautiful. I need to focus. Uh, yeah. Here we go. Okay. Yeah, so that is basically the yeah, the part here of the mushroom. Let me let me I don't know center it somewhere. I'm having some. I'm having. I'm, 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 I'm having some problems. Actually, the camera is also kind of slow in the response. Okay, let's just leave it like this. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, so what we have here is um, this is the place where the spores normally are formed. I say normally. Can you can you see this? Where I'm I'm trying to point with the. Okay, I'm trying to point with a, a with a toothpick, but I cannot find it. Here it is. Okay. Oh, it, it, it's I'm having I'm, I'm having a problem now a little bit. Okay. It okay it doesn't matter. Um, in any case, uh, this is the place where the spores are formed, and um, I unfortunately was not able to find any spores when I tried this today in the afternoon. And I think uh, the reason is that the mushroom um, the mushrooms um, still are not uh, quite uh, ripe yet because you see on the bottom they're still closed. And what's going to happen is the cap is going to open, um, and then the spores are able to fall out and uh, they're able to be spread by the wind. And uh, the cap has not opened yet. Um, and I think therefore the spores are not 
have not formed yet. Okay, it's my hypothesis. Okay, uh, but what you might want to try out if you have a, a ripe mushroom, so to say, um, what you do is is um, you uh, basically take the mushroom and uh, you uh, put it on a you put it on a microscope slider or on a piece of paper like this, and then you knock against it like this. Okay, and what's going to happen is, is that the spores are going to fall out and they're going to make this nice pattern, um, yeah, on paper. Um, and that's how you can collect the spores. Okay, um, so but unfortunately we don't have, at least I was not able to get any spores out. Um, but what we can try to do is, is we can nevertheless try to take a little bit of this mushroom, pluck it apart and uh, uh, check it again under the microscope whether we're able to see those filamentous, uh, um, how do you call, call it, hyphae. Okay, I need a I need a slide. Okay, so here again, I have a slide here, and I wipe them again a little bit. And the next thing that I'm going to do here is, is I'm going to grab a little piece of this mushroom. You know what? I mean, I could just also try try one of these things here as, as well. The nice thing about these mushrooms is, is that um, they are so soft. Um, these here that um, it's easy to kind of pluck them apart. And uh, yeah. and uh, you can also kind of squeeze it much easier. But let's uh, take a small sample here. Uh, you know what I'm going to do? I need to cut it. Yeah, let's take it here. That's way too much. Um, I'm going to add again a little bit of water because a little bit of water makes uh, it a little bit easier for me to of plug it apart and uh, I'm going to take again some fresh toothpicks just so that I'm not adding any so now again you have got to be a bit, bit patient and you have to try to separate as much as possible um, I think uh, that uh, this preparation is really half of the trick if you don't prepare well you're also not going to see a lot so, and the more time you spend doing this, uh, I would say probably the better the result. But to save time, I might not be doing this uh, well enough. But just, yeah, you know, I'm just going to try it like this. Add a little more. And sometimes what helps is, is actually to apply a little bit of pressure. Okay. Here we go again. And uh, what I sometimes do is, is I take some tissue paper, put some tissue paper beneath it, on top of it, okay, and then you apply, apply some vertical pressure. Uh, the tissue paper will remove any excess. Don't want to break the slide, obviously. It will uh, remove any excess uh, water as well. Ooh, that's a lot. Um, okay, so let's, uh, have, let's give it a try. And let's give it a try. I need to switch over to the microscope view again. And uh, too much light. Okay, I see that it's very dense. Uh, yeah, I should have uh, plucked it apart better. But here on the side, oh yeah, yeah. And of course, uh, too little water as well. So yeah, but we see. Um, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm going to add a little bit of water now, simply to uh, make sure that it's a little bit uh, better visible. Yep, you probably have seen now that. Uh, yeah, hmm. yeah. This is an example of of where we see that I've not plucked it apart properly yet. Make it again, yeah. But, you're, but you still are, should be able to see all of those uh, the long cells here, okay? And here way too dense again because it did not separate well enough. Way too dense. Uh, here, not a good specimen. Uh, today in the afternoon I was a little bit more successful but I also spent a little more time in, in actually um, Try over here on the other side. Um, yep. 
yeah it's on the sides here hmm yeah uh, I mean you get the idea yeah but it kind of also demonstrates a little bit how dense uh, the network um, of cells actually is So of course this begs the question a little bit: Is, is now a mushroom a single? Um, it's it's a, yeah. Should we count it as a as a multicellular organism? Well, of course it's made of many cells, right? Uh, but uh, many of the cells are actually very similar. So there is not as much cell differentiation um, as in other organisms. And if you have now take a couple of these mycelia or these hyphae uh, cells and then you're able to grow a new mushroom um, out of it would you actually now say that the fungus is actually a single celled organism because you're able to grow you know, a completely new organism out of a few of those cells here it's a little bit a question of definition as well yeah, um, yeah so I, I quickly go, um, go up again to some of the questions here what about a live stream of blood, like putting blood under the microscope? Oh yeah, sure. Um, I've done this in some of my videos as well. That's also possible. Yeah, I can do that. I can do some methylene blue staining, and then you can see the white blood cells. Yeah. Um, thank you for the suggestion. However, I don't know if if a one hour live stream is uh, it's it's done in a couple of minutes. So <laughs> I don't know if I'm able to fill a full hour. Yeah. Thanks for the great videos. Based on your video suggestions, I bought an introductory microscope as a birthday present for my daughter. She will get it tomorrow. Ah. For sixth birthday, yes, <laughs> that's nice. When you make a slide by letting the spores fall down, that's a spore print. That is correct. Yes. Um, what some people are doing is, is um, if you want, uh, if you don't want to, um, you can do a spore print also on paper. So essentially, so that uh, when you knock on the spore, then you get the, the pattern, um, and uh, you can then try to use some glue or whatever to kind of uh, fix it. Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, so this was kind of this mushroom over here. Um, I'm going to now show you um, the 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 black um, the, the black wood ear mushroom. I think that's how it's called, at least according to my research. Um, and this is this one over here. And this was actually a difficult one to process. Let me show this to you. Desk. Desk. Yeah, here it. That, that, that's this one over here. Um, it was difficult because it's very um, um, gel-like and a little bit solid and kind of uh, taking, the, uh, taking it apart was not so easy. Um, still, um, if you watch the video, then I kind of showed you that uh, it's kind of interesting, this one here, because it seems to be a so-called an aseptate, it, it seems to have so-called aseptate hyphae. This basically means that um, um, the individual cells are not so visible. I mean, it's like the hyphae, the, the, uh, the filaments are very long and they're multinucleated. So this basically means that it's, it's like a long structure which sometimes contains hundreds of nuclei. Um, because I was um, not able to stain the nuclei, um, you need a, um, with methylene blue it did not stain properly, but still I'm able to now show you a little bit or at least I try to show you now how this looks under the microscope. So that's basically a little bit of a repetition of what I've been doing in my other videos. I need to open the box. Here, here we go. So um, let's let's give it a try. I need to get myself, um, yeah, one of these things here. I don't know. I'm going to choose one which is easy to, which is kind of soft. So maybe this, this appears to be pretty soft. So let's uh, do the following. Let's take a small sample here. Get some of the excess liquid removed. And this is a little difficult to process because it's very slimy, very slippery, very jelly like. And let's try a little bit here. Okay. Where is it? Here it is. Oop. Just the second. Where is it? It's here on my scissors. Here we go. Um, and now what? Um, I now need to somehow um, make this way smaller. Just a second. Let's remove. Let's remove this here. And uh, we add a cover glass. We add a cover glass 
and now we try to yeah compress it in such a way but it's kind of always tries to slide out a little bit <laughs> so that's a very difficult thing we try to compress this without actually breaking the cover glass and this is the difficult part so this takes a lot of patience sometimes maybe it's easier if we actually make it yet smaller so you actually now know what's kind of going on behind the scenes when I make a video because all of these things I'm not showing you in the video everything seems to work right away and without problems but sometimes there is quite a bit of, of, of trial and error going on as well uh, see it kind of always comes out so this was actually a part which is a uh, which was more it's more difficult to to actually process see it always moves out okay I don't know we can yes uh, now a little bit on my finger as well I'm, I'm going to try it maybe I got a few of the cells um, on here I don't know um, so that's uh, going to be a little bit of a yeah of a playing a little bit with luck here sometimes uh, no no not so no I this is not nice lots of bubbles here so try again try again maybe I'm going uh, it depends I also found out that uh, it depends quite a bit a little bit on the um, on the actual piece of the fungus because not all parts of the fun fungus um, are equally have the same consistency so let's try to let's try this here maybe okay It's very, it's very, um, up. Oh, you cannot see that what I'm doing because um, I still have the microscope view. Sorry about that. Yeah, here I'm just trying to pluck it apart as much as I can. And that is basically all stuff that I had to do um, also when I made the video, but I did not show that to you. So sometimes in the videos that I'm publishing, it looks a little bit easier than in real life. Uh, and that is now the uncensored version <laughs> the full length version <laughs> um, let's add a little bit of water here otherwise I'm not going to compress it otherwise I'm just going to try to leave it as it is okay um, and uh, let's see how well this actually works it's it's very thick I think it's 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 quite thick it is quite thick ah uh, yeah but still I think we were a little bit lucky because we now can we can actually now see again those filaments here but of course uh, focusing is significantly more difficult because of the relatively because the specimen is quite thick okay so let's go up a little bit with the magnification again yeah and when I looked at this under the microscope um, I, I could actually um, yeah see that those uh, hyphae looked very um, homogeneous so basically there were, there were I could not see any subdivisions which is an indication that this is so called an aseptate seems to be an aseptate fun fungus yeah. yeah here yeah it's not the nicest it's not the nicest specimen now in, in the video that I made looks actually much nicer ah here we actually see it a little bit better yeah. So the specimen is fairly thick. Yeah. Yep, this is how it looks like. And um, I have actually a couple of months ago, um, 
um, I was actually able to um, on on a plate on a, on a gro in growth medium. I had actually a fungus growing, a mold growing, and I, I put it also under the microscope, stereo microscope, and I could actually see and observe the actual growth of those hufe under the microscope. This was actually also something that I wanted to actually show to you, and that's why I wanted to kind of germinate those uh, those spores, which unfortunately didn't work as I told you before. But that is actually the next thing that I'm I'm going to be working on. It's kind of to optimize the conditions in such a way that I'm able to actually see the actual growth of, of the cells under the microscope, okay? Um, yeah, I quickly skip down again. Okay, there are so far no more questions for me, which is also fine. So, um, yeah, so uh, what I'm gonna do, I ho hope you get the idea. So essentially, um, bottom line is, is uh, whatever um, specimen you use, uh, you've got to make uh, sure that you somehow bring it into a form that you can actually uh, observe it under the microscope. So you might have to squeeze it or separate this or, or you know, so a little bit of preparation is necessary to, to actually see something. So let's move on. Um, there's another thing I want to show you, which uh, basically is a little bit of a coincidence, which I've seen. And, uh, and this is where it's starting to get a little bit uh, where I want to move the food out of the way uh, because I don't want it, it to get in contact with uh, my the plate that I'm going to show you now. Okay. What's the name of this brown fungus? Um, the name of the seems to be um, the so-called the black wood ear fungus. Black wood ear. If you go in Wikipedia, you will actually um, yeah um, find a, um, it's a. Um, yeah, I got it from some some uh, some uh, Chinese um, food. I was cooking some Chinese food the other day, so they had these prepared vegetables. Yeah, and that's how I basically got the fungus because I generally don't like to eat fungi uh, very much. Not one of my favorite foods. I kind of picked them out, <laughs> um, and uh, I said I'm going to put them under the microscope. Yeah? It's called the black wood ear fungus, and I think it must be, unless I'm mistaken, it must be the one. So what I'm going to show you now is uh, the something where I have to be a little careful now because I don't want to inhale it. Again, the desk, and I need to explain this here what we've got here. This is um, an agar plate um, and uh, with some E. coli uh, bacteria growing on it. Uh, this is an experiment that uh, I'm doing with one of my students in school. And uh, there is a contaminant, a fungus, a mold growing on here. This can happen, um, shouldn't happen, can happen when a spore f falls onto the growth medium and then it will the spore will start to germinate and then you will have a fungus growing. And uh, you don't want to open this plate because then you have the spores coming out and then essentially you inhale it and in some cases uh, people can become allergic. Right? And I don't know what fungus it is, so it could be a poisonous one, it could be one that's not poisonous, I have no idea. It's a uh, wild fungus and therefore um, you don't want to mess around with it, but I'm going to show it to you anyway. I'm going to put it under the microscope and I'm going to yeah, look at it as well, because that is a very nice, huge example of a mold. Okay, I'm going to refocus again here. Um, those little tabs that you see um, contain, yeah, so, so the E. coli bacteria are growing here in the background and we um, added some substances on those little um, yeah, white little pads uh, to test the growth of the E. coli bacteria but we can also see that there's a fungus growing and we can also see that the fungus ha has different colors and uh, this also indicates that there are some parts where the fungus is actively growing and parts where the fungus is making spores. So number one I'm going to put it again under my micro stereo mi microscope. Okay. And uh, I have to put it in here. I have to refocus again. I'm able to find the focus. Okay, and this is how it looks like. Okay, so you see, very fuzzy. Okay, here we're at the edge now. Okay, and what I'll be doing now is, is I'll be grabbing some of this uh, yeah, fuzz and, uh, and to put it under the microscope again, okay? And this is actually this uh, fungus that I've taken uh, today in the morning a little bit and uh, added uh, some yeast extract liquid. Um, so I've got some yeast extract here, okay? Uh, with a little bit of water and I was kind of hoping that uh, this is gonna make the spores grow, but it didn't. And uh, yeah, 
because sometimes fungi do not only need nutrients but they need to have a proper surface maybe they didn't like it that they were surrounded by liquid all the time and there was no surface to attach to so there could be maybe a variety of factors why they did not grow or maybe I simply didn't give it enough time and I'm not gonna breathe and what I'm going to do now is, is I'm going to simply grab a little specimen here and I'm going to put it again on the microscope slide together with a little bit of water and uh, yeah how am I gonna do that um, I have done the following today in the morning and I'm going to do it again um, I'm going to grab a little bit some of this here with my tweezers trying to suspend it in here I don't I don't see anything so I don't know if I've actually gotten something yes now we got it okay so a lot of it um, I'm going to immediately close it again and uh, the tweezers here um, I have to disinfect uh, so a little bit of alcohol Normally what you're going to do is, is uh, alcohol alone not enough, uh, but that you actually would actually hold it into a flame. So, but I'm going to properly disinfect it later on. Okay. Um, yeah. So let's uh, trash this. And uh, yeah, as always, uh, some toothpicks here. Let's uh, spread it apart again. Um, not too much because I do not want to destroy the, the structure because today in the morning when I did that I could actually see uh, some of the spore forming structures as well um, so and then to just give it a try and uh, off we go again microscope view so let's remove this and let's put this in here I have to refocus again. Okay, yeah. I think you get the idea that there are plenty, again, plenty of spores again. So let me find, yeah, the magnification is way too high. I need to find some, maybe this here. Okay, there is some more stuff here. No, it's too dense. Yep, um, gotta find. Yeah, okay. Mostly spores. Ah, you see, you can. Can you actually see them shake a little bit? That seems to be the Brownian movement. Uh, the spores, uh, yeah, they do not move on their own, but it's uh, because of the uh, water molecules which have a temperature bumping into the spores. That's why they're shaking. Yeah, so that's the so-called the Brownian motion. Honestly, lots of spores. Um, kind of. Yeah, of course they spread over the air you inhale them some people respond allergically be to those yeah and uh, yeah honestly not so I've had today a nicer specimen yeah but you do see some again some of the hyphae hmm here is again Ah, yeah, okay. Um, so this is um, essentially something that's actually quite nice. I can actually talk about this here a little bit. Do you see here? It's one of the hyphae, and you see that over here with those tiny, these are the tiny the cross divisions that you see here. These are the so-called the septa, these are the septa. Um, and basically this makes one cell, right? 
and usually um, usually when you have this there's usually one nucleus in one of these cells and then the other one in the black wood ear mushroom um, it was a so called an aseptate hyphae um, aseptate mushroom it did not have those cross divisions yeah but essentially it was like one large gigantic structure yeah and here yeah we see that uh, there are those here again yeah those cross divisions ah okay you can also see over here that there seems to be some yeah um, start of some branching going on it's also one of a uh, characteristic um, of uh, certain fungi is is that they that they are branching again over here across the division ah uh, here also you can see yeah so let me quickly go back again into the chat because I'm skipping ahead again okay what is the name of this brown fungus which oh yeah oh I talked about this uh, this was the the blackwood ear off topic question did you put antimicrobial soap under the microscope yet um, what I've what we've done here is um, what I have done is already not antimicrobial soap but other disinfectants um, under the microscope like those uh, um, um, that contain uh, hydrogen peroxide um, and you can actually see that uh, how they actually um, affect uh, microorganisms yeah so not antimicrobial soap but something I might also try but I've uh, tried other disinfectants what colors can mold have oh honestly <laughs> all, all, all colors of the rainbow <laughs> seriously um, yeah um, I've seen from really really all colors I've already seen yeah? um, so many of them are of course are bluish grayish white but I've seen red ones yellow whatever right yeah um, yeah, black or green very often, but I've seen um, um, all sorts of colors already. Yeah. Should you not use a face mask for this? We would like to see you back next week. <laughs> uh, oh, by the way, <laughs> yes, before I respond, that, what a coincidence. Yeah, that's one of those uh, spore forming structures. Do you see this? Yeah, yeah, that is basically here on the tip. Yeah, and it starts to form those spores. Well, that's a coincidence that I actually got it in here right now. Yeah. Yeah, so that's basically yeah, a type of fungus which has those uh, external deforming spores. Yeah, yeah so that mean, means yeah, um, you, one has to be careful, um, but uh, generally, um, especially in old buildings when there's a lot of dust around, uh, you could, sometimes it's, it's also not so healthy. Yeah? How does the mold feel when you touch it with tweezers? <laughs> um, they don't have a nervous system. Yeah. Um, so they probably have not felt anything but uh, like all living things uh, all living things respond to environmental changes yeah? so um, so I don't think the I'm quite sure they have not felt anything yeah <laughs> but uh, still uh, I'm a bit confused with the Brownian motion water molecules are very small how can they create such an impact on the microorganism I guess a bunch of water molecules can do that um, yeah um, Let's put it this way. There is a simple and a more complex way of explaining this. The movement that you see over here is um, like this, that uh, because the water molecules move randomly, um, generally um, it can be that uh, more water molecules bump into one side of the, um, of, 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 of the spore than from the other side and then that kind of pushes it over. So it's a question of statistics. That's one way of explaining it. I, I did a little research a couple of months ago and they basically said that this is a bad explanation and the re reality this has to do, the, 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 the physics are way more complicated but often it is taught with mo water molecules bumping against the object. But apparently this is, a very, is somewhat an inaccurate description. But I have to tell you I don't know much more about this either. Yeah? It has to do with local pressure changes changes um, this Brownian motion apparently but uh, yeah it, it, it kind of goes a little bit beyond that what I'm um, yeah I'm able to explain now yeah it would be good if you can time lapse the Hufe I tried to do this um, several times already um, but um, I did not see a lot of difference okay so this means uh, apparently I was not able to recreate the ideal growth conditions on the microscope slide However, I was able to see the growth of the hufe on a petri dish. 
Um, so this is a little bit of a thing that um, when I have to work on. Maybe you have to get the right type of mold, the right temperature, the right conditions, um, and then you might be able to see their growth. Um, but I was not able to, to see it on a microscope slide yet, but uh, with time lapse. So, uh, but this is something indeed that I've been trying out. Yeah? Did you ever try to view microscope fossils? Well, um, yeah, if you consider the di um, uh, diatomaceous earth as uh, fossilized diatoms, um, yes, um, I basically diatomaceous earth I also put under the microscope, which also looks nice. And actually, strictly speaking, these are fossils. Okay. Uh, we probably breathe thousands of spores every day, not only thousands, probably even more. And indeed, our immune system and our lungs are able to, to how do you say, deal with that. But if you really now have a very high concentration like here, then that might overload our lungs as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you think there is a visible difference between regular soap and antibacterial soap? Um, possibly. I'll, I'll have to be honest with you. i tell you what the problem with bacteria is. Um, if you uh, observe bacteria under the microscope, many bacteria do not move on their own. Um, they are also bumped around by Brownian motion, like we talked about, but you do not know always by looking under the microscope whether bacteria are actually alive or not. Okay, so that's a problem. Of course, some bacteria that move, um, and when you add some stuff, then they die off, they stop moving, but for some bacteria, it's not like this. Some time ago, I made a video where I added some vinegar, check in this channel here, vinegar to spiral shaped bacteria, and you can actually see how the vinegar kills them off. So that's nice. You can actually see, <laughs> see that it has an effect. For many non-moving bacteria, you don't know that because um, they don't move before and they don't move afterwards. So um, for this reason, uh, microscopy is not always the best way of determining how many live bacteria are present. You actually have to grow the bacteria on a petri dish to find out and do a bacterial count there, a colony count. Yeah? Um, so uh, when you're asking about a visible difference, um, then I have to probably say um, possibly, but it depends whether you're actually able to detect this difference. Yeah? So this is a little bit the, 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 the issue here. Right? Um, it can also be that um, it depends a lot on, on, on um, I would say, uh, the concentration of the soap as well. Yeah? So if you use very dilute antibacterial soap, it might not work as well maybe as, as very strong um, uh, the regular soap. Yeah? Um, but even regular soap, because it's uh, alkaline, um, it dissolves, yeah, and because of the detergent, it will actually dissolve the membrane of many, uh, many uh, bacteria. In, in any case, yeah. So what time is it even? Oh, it's one hour twenty-one already. Time, time flies again. Um, yeah. So this is basically the 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 mold under the the microscope, and um, because people were asking about bacteria, uh, what I decided to do. Um, just as a little, how do you say, bonus. Um, I'm going, to, and just because I have the plate here, and I've done this already some weeks ago, but maybe some of you have not seen this yet, I'm gonna put some of the E. coli bacteria here also under the microscope, so that you see a little bit how they actually look different to fungi, okay? Bacteria and fungi have an interesting similarity in that they, both of them release, are saprotrophs, this means both of them release enzymes for extracellular digestion. It means digesting the food outside of the cell and then reabsorbing the nutrients. Yeah, so that's kind of the similarity that they have. Yeah? Um, so, but uh, yeah, I'll again grab a little bit of um, here and uh, desk. Okay, here we go. Um, again, a little bit of water. Um, a toothpick. Um, question, what do you think of the quote Ant-Man franchise's take on microscopy? Honestly, maybe you can give, I don't know, I don't know that. I don't know Ant-Man. Um, is this, uh, uh, should I know about him? Uh, please uh, tell me a little bit more, uh, uh, would be interesting. Yeah? Um, I have to Google him, I don't know much about it, uh, maybe yeah, I'll, if, if he's online somewhere. Um, then I'll have a look at it. Yeah. So uh, let's. Uh, I'm going to scratch off now um, a little bit of the 
okay? A tiny amount of these are E. coli bacteria, okay? So they are safe, but of course you never know if there are any contaminants on here, yeah? So trash this and uh, then uh, let's uh, put a cover glass on here. And um, yeah, it's still a little bit lot lick a lot of liquid here. And uh, let's uh, now look at bacteria, okay, just so that you see a little comparison. Many folks who are starting off with microscopy, the first thing they want to see are bacteria. And I would say actually bacteria kind of boring. Um, so let me have a look here. Um, I have to see to which direction I have to focus now. Yeah, here here they are. And those little tiny dots are bacteria. So you already see that there is a huge size difference and you see that they're really wiggling around, not because they're moving on their own, but indeed because of Brownian motion. Because if uh, bacteria that are really moving, they're actually really moving into a direction, they have a really direct movement. Yeah. Okay. Royal Raymond Rife. Ah, I know this guy. Was an American inventor and uh, uh, high magnification time lapse. Royal Raymond Rife, the universal microscope he invented, and apparently he claimed that he was able to see viruses and all these things. Unfortunately, um, it didn't work. Uh, um, yes, yeah. Um, yeah, um, unfortunately, that what he, he claimed uh, did a little bit. There were some articles in, in uh, some interesting science articles um, about him. Um, the claims uh, that he made with his microscope, unfortunately, are physically not possible. Yeah, um, he claimed that he could go beyond the resolution limit. Yeah, that is unfortunately not uh, possible. Yeah. So um, yeah, so what I'm going to do now um, is uh, is um, I'm going to simply show you. This is a little bit of a, a thing that I just wanted to to um, yeah. So this is now. Let me. This is now Brightfield. Okay, forty times. You, you, almost very difficult to see the bacteria. Very, okay, DIC. We need to do a little bit of adjustment here at forty times. Also a little bit difficult to see. Now let's try phase contrast. I need to adjust the condenser. And here, you're actually able to see the bacteria a little bit better because they are darker on a brighter background. Right? So because the bacteria have a different refractive index, for this reason that the optics converts it into brightness differences. Yeah? So um, this was just a little bit of a comparison so that you see that there is a, quite a big difference between bacteria and fungi. So bacteria are significantly smaller um, and uh, kind of difficult uh, uh, to see even with a microscope like I have. Yeah? Yeah, so just wanted to, to, yeah, to clarify this a little bit. Yeah? Because people have been asking me yeah, so this is again 60 times in DIC. Yeah? And one of the things that I'm also uh, I'm experimenting around with and I have to try the so-called the hanging drop method is, is um, I would like to actually observe a bacterial division under the microscope. Fast dividing bacteria like these, they should divide once every 20 minutes. But the problem is, is that um, if I leave the slide on the microscope for a couple of hours, it's going to evaporate, right? And I cannot add any more liquid because then I'm not able to do a time lapse video because it's going to it's going to flush the bacteria away. So um, you, I need to, to try out a different uh, mechanism, the so-called the hanging drop method, where you actually uh, have the bacteria in a droplet of of, of of liquid suspended in a concave slide um, and sealed off with Vaseline so that no water can evaporate, um, and then you are able to to do um, all the time lapse. So that's kind of the stuff that I'm kind of working on uh, a little bit. Yeah? So just to give you a little bit of, a, of an insight of some of my other projects, yeah? Okay. Did you ever use an electron microscope? Um, I myself did not have the opportunity yet to use one. Um, I, however, uh, uh, because they wouldn't al allow us students to actually touch the electron microscope um, because uh, you needed special training for that. 
and um, essentially it was like this that um, at the Botanical Institute um, of the University well, where I did a tour a long time ago I was able to see that um, essentially they had people who were uh, in charge of the electron microscope and if you wanted to have something researched then you had to give them the sample and they would do it for you and then they would give you back a picture yeah? but they wouldn't allow uh, people to touch the electron microscope yeah? so it's a little bit like with the telescopes uh, these days in astronomy that uh, you basically have uh, you have those operators and then you basically tell them what picture they should take of the sky and then they will actually send you the picture yeah? so unfortunately I personally was not I did not have the possibility yet yeah? It did work, they use it now. New articles say that they use crystal lenses, not glass. Okay, that's interesting. Never heard of this. Okay. What will happen if you add bacteria and fungi together? Well, honestly, there are um, natural uh, uh, kefir, which is a fungus and bacteria. So this happens all the time. Um, and it depends really, um, it depends really which type of bacteria and which type of fungi. Some, some fungi produce uh, antibiotics. Uh, which actually kill off bacteria um, sometimes they gr grow together and live together so um, everything is possible yeah? so sometimes if you actually see a, a um, some moldy food and if you put some mold of the food under the microscopes very often you are also going to see that that their bacteria are present as well yeah so um, it's it's nothing unusual so in nature you can find pretty much any imaginable combination yeah, yeah. simply basically uh, even sy uh, symbiotic re relationships where they kind of interdepend on each other huh? Marvel comic blog okay ah okay <laughs> oh the Ant-Man now I darkly remember Marvel comics <laughs> okay <laughs> okay um, electron microscopes used to fill a room back in the day we have them now in our labs and they fill yep um, I also remember at that time there was actually there was one room with the electron microscope and the room next to it had the vacuum pumps um, to uh, to pump the air out of the, the electron microscope they had a separate room simply only for the pumps uh, to pump out the air to make a vacuum yeah so uh, what don't you think uh, honey shrunk the kids <laughs> okay honey uh, huh, <laughs> yeah uh, I, 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 no, I think I, honey I shrunk the kids uh, the title sounds familiar <laughs> okay um, <laughs> okay um, what I will do now is what I will do now is um, I think uh, I've been now talking for one and a half hours again um, I think I'm just going to come to a close uh, for right now um, again um, yeah um, if you have any recommendations of what you want me to put under the microscope, please do leave suggestions. I'm going to advertise, not advertise, I'm going to just say that um, I would like to encourage and invite people um, to make videos uh, on microscopy, okay? Because I said, well, why not celebrate 300 years of Anthony van Leeuwenhoek, the first microscopist. He passed away in 1723, 300 years ago. And I said, well, if you make videos and if you add this hashtag somewhere in the title or in the description, uh, in his memory then maybe we can have a little yeah, community project uh, where people who uh, have not yet made videos or articles or pictures or so uh, to encourage you and then uh, by putting this hashtag on there um, yeah if you just google for this then your video pops up and then you also get a little bit of exposure this way um, yeah even if your channel otherwise uh, is very small um, and not yet known by many people by adding a hashtag it can, your videos can be easily be found okay so um, so what I'm gonna do now is, is I'm just reading the last comments here okay yeah and what I'm gonna do now is I'm just going to leave it at that again um, I hope that uh, it was again interesting for you um, if you um, have any suggestions of anything else that you want me to put on the microscope please do leave comments behind uh, last week somebody mentioned uh, that uh, he or she wanted to see all of my slides uh, containing human specimens um, I don't have so many slides with human specimens but I have slides containing mammalian tissues uh, commercially prepared slides I might I'm thinking about uh, maybe showing them to you next time um, I have not made up my mind yet um, but uh, yeah I'm working on again uh, some um, um, a, a topic that hopefully will find you interest um, yeah so I wish you all the best uh, for right now um, hopefully see you again next week uh, if you are not subscribed yet I would like to invite you this is important actually um, also please do subscribe to um, um, other microscopy youtubers 
okay because uh, this way their channels are and the community becomes a little bit yeah more more popular this way um, and uh, then also microscopy is supported this way and I hope uh, that uh, by with the modern media with uh, with YouTube and all these in the internet and the forums uh, this way we're able to promote the hobby a little bit more okay um, yeah I wish you all the best um, see you again next time happy microbe hunting as always and uh, bye bye